good evening everyone myself prithu raj student of dr dy patil law college and first of all i would like to thanks dr dy patil law college for giving me opportunity to moderate this event on behalf of dr dy patil law college i welcome to our senior advocate dr sudhakar yavat sir who is going to speak on philosophical trends in constitutional jurisprudence by judgment of the supreme court so now i would like to invite our uh, principal ma'am dr ujwala sinde to for a welcome speech हम यू आर म्यूटेड रीजन ना ये किया अनम्यूट किया गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डॉक्टर डी वाई पाटिल यूनिटेक सोसाइटीज डॉक्टर डी वाई पाटिल लॉ कॉलेज आई वेलकम एन एमिनेंट पर्सनैलिटी डॉक्टर एस ई अवार्ड सर आई ऑल्सो वेलकम ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स स्टूडेंट्स लॉयर्स and my colleague teachers and a deep sense of gratitude video award sir who has accepted to address the webinar my deep sense of gratitude towards management of dr d y patil unitec society i'm sure you all will agree that this is going to be the feast of knowledge to all of us i once again welcome you all and uh, i am not taking much of your time and uh, i invite sir uh, for the webinar thank you that ma'am uh, i would like to invite sundar mr sundaram varthi uh, for a brief introduction about our speaker sir oh thank you mr raj good afternoon ladies and gentlemen i am sundaram varthi welcoming you all for the today's session Furthermore, Dr. D. Y. Patil Law College Pune extends a warm welcome for today's session for a webinar series titled "Philosophical Trend in Constitutional Jurisprudence by Judgment of the Supreme Court." We are related to host Dr. S. E. Award, a senior advocate having a standing of 41 years in Bombay High Court and Pune Pune District Court. Mr. Award has a vast experience in matters on diverse fields of law, including but surely not limited to constitutional law, land law, civil law, and criminal law in the past he was also designated as the chairman of the bar council of maharashtra and goa moreover he has been involved as an academia since 1977 mr award has also authored a number of books on judicial services examination and other subjects of law catering students with immense amount of experience of practicing cases related to constitutional matters we are privileged to have him speak today on the aforesaid topic now without any further ado i request sir to please begin thank you namaskar i'm thankful to the management of dr d v patil law college principal dr ujwala madam the teachers staff professors and my student friends brothers and sisters i'm very happy with you this afternoon friends as the college and the management and the principal has given me this opportunity to be with you for discussing the development of philosophical trends in the jurisprudence constitutional jurisprudence by the judgments of the supreme court really the principal madam has given me this opportunity and the subject which is given to me is a really a different subject let us first try try to understand what is jurisprudence has been said for my uh, law student colleagues that the jurisprudence is a branch of law which is said to be the queen of law or legal subjects or legal science generally speaking it is said that jurisprudence is a science what is science is said to be a systematic study of anything let us see friends in course of law there are three things firstly in course of law we provide for law or enacted law or a statutory law and then there are cases before the courts 
and then cases are decided and ultimately decisions are delivered judgments are passed by the courts however when the matter goes to the high courts and to the apex or the supreme court matter is different here issue is different especially the judgments are delivered and there is philosophy behind such judgments such philosophy we have to understand today how these judgments are delivered this philosophy let us try to understand and this philosophy is to be discussed with reference to the supreme court of india and the position of the supreme court of india to understand the position of the supreme court of india let us see the legacy of the supreme court friends to understand the legacy of the supreme court the issue is with reference to the judgments of the supreme courts to be understood with reference to the federal court before establishment of our supreme court by the constitution of india there had been the federal court established under the government of india act 1935 when the days were in view it was a dawn of the independence it was certain that india is going to get independence then there was government of india act 1935 enacted by the british parliament and by virtue of the government of uh, india act 1935 there was constitution and establishment of federal court at delhi this federal court continued till the supreme court succeeded supreme court is successor of the federal court established under the government of india act 1935 the legacy of the federal court continued uh, with reference to the today supreme court today supreme court is established as per the constitution as we know that constitution that has been accorded that has been ratified by the people of india on 26 november 1949 and then after coming to force of the constitution of india the supreme court came to be established by virtue of the provisions in the constitution in the beginning friends there were the there was the constitution of the supreme court there was chief justice of the supreme court and uh, maximum seven judges to be appointed however uh, by exigencies of time this number has been increased by the 1977 parliamentary law that has been increased to 17 thereafter it has been increased to 25 in the year 1986 and lastly that has been increased to 30 today friends there is Uh, strength of the supreme court chief justice of india plus 30 judges in all 31 judges then issue comes as to how the chief justice is to be appointed i will not go to into those details as to collegium system and then as to the national judicial commission and all other things issue simply was how the chief justice is to be appointed and not the judge of the supreme court judge of the supreme court and the high court judge they are to be appointed with reference to the collegium system however that is not our today's point today's point is how chief justice is going to be appointed and chief justice was appointed after commencement of the constitution by convention by president the senior most judge of the supreme court was appointed as the chief justice of the supreme court this was the convention this was the president followed however in the year 1956 the law commission of india headed over by uh, mc settlewar the great uh, legal illuminary the recommendations were made by him that he said let us not follow the principle of seniority alone let us see the fit person for this post this was the recommendation made by uh, mc settlewar the then uh, chairman of the law commission of india the seniority aspect the conventions were disturbed to some extent by recommendations of the law commission and the fit person formula was to be adopted in the run of the time as we are discussing there were fundamental rights introduced that is our course of discussion for next hour or so fundamental rights were uh, uh, introduced or were given to the indian citizens by indian citizens themselves then this fundamental rights issue was before the supreme court we are going to discuss at a later stage in all details but in this fundamental rights case there was a issue before the supreme court and by deciding this fundamental rights case now the judgment was to be delivered and when judgment was to be delivered there was after delivering the judgment within few hours time within few hours time a chief justice was appointed who was junior he was fourth level Uh, he was at the fourth stage 
Justice Henry, he was at fourth stage. Justice Sela, Justice Grover, and Justice Hegre, they were the in seniority list to become Chief Justices. However, at the influence of the then Prime Minister of India, uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi, uh, Justice A. N. Ray, he was selected as, he was appointed as the Chief Justice of India and remaining three judges were superseded. Those three great judges, they resigned from the post of the judge of the Supreme Court. As this was done, issue was that judgments are to be delivered Democracy is to be uh, run, and that is to be run with reference to social philosophy. Whose philosophy? Whose philosophy is material? And philosophy was material. Now there were two aspects with this fundamental rights case, and thereafter appointment of Justice A. N. Ray as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now there were dichotomy. There was a dichotomy. There was a division of opinion among the jurists. Whose philosophy shall prevail? Whether it is the philosophy of whether it is the philosophy of the ruling party recommending his name, like Ayn Ray, or whether it is philosophy of the constitution. Friends, that is our scope of the discussion today. It is whose philosophy? Because the then uh, chief justices were appointed at the recommendations of the prime minister and the president of India, whether they shall be dominated by the philosophy of the appointing authority, or whether they shall have allegiance to the constitution, of which they have taken the oath was the issue before the Supreme Court for a pretty long time. In the Supreme Court, therefore, this issue lasted for a couple of years. To understand this issue and to understand this discussion, friends, let us come to today's point. That is as to theory of precedent. All these philosophical changes in the portals of the Supreme Court are because of the concept of the precedent. For those uh, my colleagues in the colleges who have studied subject of jurisprudence, they must be knowing theory of precedent. Our teachers they have taught us theory of precedent in jurisprudence. In case of legislation, and there is a theory of precedent related concepts. In two lines, theory of precedent is the ratio or the principle laid down by the superior court, that is Supreme Court, or by the high court, that is to be followed by the inferior court in future. That is theory of precedent in one sentence. Where from this theory of precedent came, as we every now and then, every lawyer, every professor, uh, every student speaks of precedent. And friends, this theory has its back or its reference to the year uh, 12,000 to uh, 12,068. It was the time of great writer and uh, legal personality, Henry Bracton. Henry Bracton was a judge. He was a judge in the uh, Queen's, King's Bench. In England, friends, there are two types of courts in past. One was Queen's Court and other was King's Court. Queen's and King's Court was the division. The gentleman, Henry Bracton, he was judge in King's Court. When he was judge in King's Court, he is the first personality who started uh, writing down the decisions and uh, preserving it. He said that the principle followed in one case is to be followed in future cases. That is how he made the law into a science. It has been said by a great judge of England and also a great writer, Lord Denning. Lord Denning says about Henry Bracton, he says that Henry Bracton was the first such person who transformed law into a science. Scientific treatment Systematic treatment was given by uh, jurist and judge Henry Bracton to the legal system. That was the beginning of theory of precedent. Binding force started from Bracton in the year uh, about 1200 to 1268. After him, laws of England were developed based on his system, which he laid down. And simultaneously, it has been said that the king of England is under no man but he is under the God and the law. Accordingly, by virtue of this principle laid down by this great jurist and judge, then King Charles I of England, he was sentenced to death. His sentence of death was to be executed and was uh, before this great judge. He said then, look here, that no man is above the law of the land. 
and uh, every person he may be not under the man but he is uh, under the law and under the god accordingly king of england charles first he was executed and he was put to death by virtue of this theory of precedent and then came another great jurist who contributed uh, to the largest extent that he was sir edward coke or professor they are knowing institutes of coke books known as institutes of coke sir edward coke he was in england he lived in england uh, between uh, 1552 to 1634 and it is said it is said about him and there is a great praise about uh, great judge sir edward coke that shakespeare has been to literature bacon has been to philosophy but uh, translating authorities have been to bible likewise coke has been to public and private law of england such a great personality was coke let us see this coke and his philosophy i am not giving uh, going to jurisprudence but i am going to such personalities who have laid down the foundation of jurisprudence in this behalf let us see this how it was impartial jurisprudence provided by them and then before this great judge there was a case when he was chief justice of england when he was chief justice of england there was a case before him that was the case known as uh, john colt and blower versus bishop coventry and lynchfield case was before justice sir edward coke and there were 12 judges sitting then and the king of england sent a note the king of england sent a note stating to all judges you wait unless you consult me don't hear this case and don't deliver the judgment issue arose in england was very uh, important issue then in england an english court and there was a strained relationship between the king and the court issue was very simple whether the king of england can ask judges of the highest court the king's court to stop the hearing and to consult the king and then to deliver the judgment was the question before the english court when this issue arose before the english court the all 11 judges of the court they said yes we have to stop we have to first consult the king and when the issue came as to answer to be and reply to be given by sir edward coke he said no he said no because king had no high in justice delivery system we shall not wait for his signal we shall not meet him in this case as soon as this was done the king in england then had a writ of supersedus rupa rupa writ of supersedus means writ to dismiss any person including the judge and the chief justice of the king's court accordingly before the king issued the writ of supersedus this great judge he resigned from the chief justice ship for not bargaining in respect of his post of chief justice friends what i intend to convey with reference to indian parliaments and with reference to appointment of justice a n ray and here was chief justice uh, sir edward coke of england he sacrificed he had given up his post of chief justice of england only for the sake of saying no i will not compromise my principles but he resigned and he went away that was the consequence then comes the last issue justice cardozo why this subject was given by uh, dr ujjwala madam to me is very simple for this basic reason whether personality of the judge contributes towards the judgment delivered or not whether personality and well being of a judge will influence the judgment whether his personality is contributory or his philosophy is contributory to the judgment to be delivered was the question before justice cardozo the chief justice of the american supreme court when justice cardozo the chief justice of the american supreme court he was faced with this similar problem that whether judges are influenced by the other things around him or surrounding him or not and here came cardozo's bold statement justice cardozo said i'll read his two lines uh, uh, version for you he said there are hydraulic pressures of great event also influence the judges they do not idly pass them by in short to simplify his version what he said is yes we the judges including the chief justice of the american supreme court we are susceptible of these pressures which are social pressures surrounding pressures and other pressures on us 
they carry a great value in this behalf. Friends, Lord Denning, he had been to Mumbai once during his lifetime. And when in Mumbai, he was addressing the lawyers and advocates and judges, this great judge of the English court in Mumbai, he quoted, he quoted uh, Fuller, the English judge, Dr. Thomas Fuller, 300 years back, 300 years back, the judge, he has said, very statement will find in judgment of the Supreme Court at a later discussion. Why I'm referring this is for a very simple reason, because to this statement of Dr. Thomas Fuller, we shall be making references in the judges of the Supreme Court, especially in the judgment of Justice Chandrachur of the Supreme Court of India. We'll discuss at a later stage. However, 300 years back, Justice Thomas Fuller, he has said, be, a, be you ever so high, the law is above you. Be you so ever high, the law is above you, means everybody under the democratic pattern of the system is subjected to the provisions of law. Law is having supremacy over all other things is the simple consequence. Friends, this was just introduction. By this introduction, what I intended to convey, this was a roadmap to, uh, for further discussion. This was a, a way to further discussion because we wanted to understand the philosophy of the judges, which changed the jurisprudence in further cases. Let us see how this changed the span of the cases, this pattern of the cases. For that purpose, let us now uh, look into part three of the constitution. Part three of the constitution comprising of articles 12 to 35 relates to fundamental rights. Regarding these fundamental rights, we have to discuss a few trends of the development of jurisprudence or constitutional jurisprudence. What are the fundamental rights? Before we understand fundamental rights, let us see about these fundamental rights, what has been said. It has been said regarding human rights, basic rights by uh, jurist law, philosopher law. Philosopher law, L-O-C-K-E, he said, a man is born with title to perfect freedom and uncontrolled enjoyment of all the rights and privileges. So, human being, as soon as he is born, automatically by birth, he should get uncontrolled rights. He should get, he should have title to the perfect freedom. That has been said by him. And that has been reflected in our constitution too. Especially after this has been said by uh, jurist law few centuries back, then came the French Revolution. The French Revolution, almost all you know it, the people from political science, they know it. The French Revolution, of 1789 that provided for, let us see only one sentence because it is a different subject, but that is very material for today's discussion. That revolution provided for the aim of the political association is the conservation of the natural and inalienable rights of a man. That was the base of, that was the foundation of the French revolution. The French Revolution provided that why we come together, why there is a political association of human beings that is so as to provide for conservation, protection, and that to be protected the inalienable rights of man. They are not separable from our personality as has been provided in the French Revolution. On this backdrop came then the Bill of Rights in the American Constitution. In American Constitution, the fundamental rights the fundamental rights therein are called as Bill of Rights. Like our chapter fundamental rights, their chapter is Bill of Rights. And one sentence is very vital from the Bill of Rights. Entire Bill of Rights is very exhaustive. One sentence is sufficient for today's discussion. They say that these are the rights which are beyond the reach of the majority and majority of the officials. So nobody shall, under the pretext of the majority, shall interfere and disturb these our fundamental rights. Was the consequence stated in Bill of Rights. Then comes the recent phenomena. All these are during 1787, 1789 and so. Then came the United Nations Organization Charter of 1948. This United Nations Char Charter of 1948, just uh, one year before the commencement of the Indian Constitution provides, and that one sentence is very vital. You must remember for your entire life, especially the teachers, that United Nations Organization Charter 1948 provided that the concepts as to rights, 
under the united nations organization charter they shall be read in the domestic jurisprudence even though these are international documents these international do these international documents shall be read as if part of indian constitution and indian law therefore that is the domestic jurisprudence these are the principles governing the provisions of law in india that was the consequence with reference to united nations organization charter and then we come to the uh, exact uh, entry into the subject that is with reference to fundamental rights i will not go to all fundamental rights and details of the fundamental rights i am going only to article 21 and my all discussion will be uh, about rotating about that discussion article 21 is the pivotal aspect for today's discussion and that our indian constitution provides for enumeration of the fundamental rights simultaneously it has been said by the architect of the indian constitution we the student of law know that architect of the indian constitution had been dr b r ambedkar dr ambedkar he provided for uh, the basic structure of this indian constitution then it has been said that american constitution and all other constitutions in the world were followed by our constituent assembly sometimes it is said indian constitution is a borrowed constitution because almost different principles they have been borrowed from different uh, constitutions say for instance directly principles of state policy we have taken it from the irish constitution likewise however there is no extreme detailing of fundamental rights under indian constitution however if you look into the american constitution there is too much detailing of the fundamental rights or bill of rights one question was asked and put to dr ambedkar why not he said if we put the detailing of the fundamental rights then what will happen they will themselves restrict their application they will restrict their scope therefore he said it is sufficient now there are courts to take care of now under article uh, 32 the supreme court and article uh, 226 and 227 the high courts will take care of this entire constitution the student of law my friends you are knowing the <clears throat> supreme court of india is said to be the guardian of the indian constitution caretaker of the indian constitution the constitution maker they have intentionally provided to that effect Uh, therefore they were uh, brief in defining making provision for such fundamental rights i will take one illustration and that is article 21 what article 21 provides no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law that is all but this simple article which are said to be very innocent which are said to be a dormant article proved to be a mainspring of the uh, development of the entire uh, constitutional jurisprudence and constitutional philosophy friends this article uh, 21 thereafter proved to be a uh, one of the uh, important article in the indian constitution let us go to that last two words what has been said by ambedkar and the members of the constituent assembly regarding our constitution was no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law immediately after commencement of the constitution immediately in the year 1950 there was a case before the supreme court let us take the first tag of development let us say the first stray development and that was development of criminal jurisprudence by the judgments of the supreme court we are going to now divide this into various segments first segment is development of criminal jurisprudence by judgments of the supreme court and in this we have we have to start from the case of ak gopalan versus state of madras air 1950 supreme court page number 27 in this first case immediately after commencement of the constitution which was before the apex court supreme court was faced with the problem that how to interpret how to interpret those two sent two words no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law supreme court was faced with only three words procedure established by law means what was the only provision to be interpreted by the uh, supreme court when this issue arose before the supreme court for discussion friends there were two issues before the supreme court the argument on behalf of ak gopalan was the argument 
on behalf of ak gopalan was this was a case regarding preventive detention law i will not go into the details of the facts but the argument on his behalf because he was detained under the preventive detention act his argument was very simple his argument was that there shall be a procedure which has to be fair which is to be reasonable which must be just however it was argued on behalf of state of madras and union of india that this procedure must be as per article 21 procedure established by law law means the preventive detention act now issue was before the supreme court whether that procedure established by law under article 21 is the just fair and reasonable procedure or whether that is procedure provided in the preventive detention act what that term law means here was the question before the supreme court in short there was a dichotomy provided there were two fold provisions made such two fold provisions were whether it shall be a procedure laid down by the preventive detention act or whether there shall be a just fair and reasonable procedure to be established and you will find surprisingly the supreme court then held the supreme court then held that procedure should be established by the preventive detention act it need not be just it need not be reasonable was the consequence of the judgment delivered by the apex court in the year 1950 that is see how there was such uh, judgment delivered we cannot say it was unjust judgment but how the rights were not properly taken into consideration by the supreme court was the criticism of his judgment after 28 years this judgment was holding and fielding a ground in india for 28 years this judgment we said that procedure need not be reasonable procedure need not be just procedure need not be uh, proper that was the consequence of the judgment for 28 years this was dominating the judgment this was the philosophy of the supreme court for 28 years only there was exception to in this judgment exception was by uh, the judgment of the justice fazal ali who was in minority my uh, student friends i will tell you that there are two views either there is unanimous judgment all are of the same view or there can be a majority judgment and there can be a minority judgment when such minority judgment was delivered by justice fazal ali of the supreme court then that was not taken into consideration but friends mind well the further law further jurisprudence is having its seeds in minority judgments only the further development always takes through the process called as minority judgments here the majority judgment prevailed in india for about 28 years and when that prevailed in india for about 28 years then thereafter came the next case by the supreme court to be decided and this next case to be decided by the supreme court will go to the case but at this stage we uh, keep in mind why the supreme court so interpreted today we say that is not the law this decision thereafter has been overruled but this overruled decision that was uh, fielding that was holding the ground in india for about 28 years when the supreme court said law need not be reasonable law need not be just law established by the preventive detention act is sufficient this was the law in india for 28 years however this minority view was there after uh, coming before the supreme court supreme court so held for a very simple reason let us friend try to understand why the supreme court might have been landed in this way of the holding this was simply because issue was uh, for the jurisprudential aspect whether article 19 freedoms article 21 and article 22 they are to be read together they are cohesive they are together or they are different articles whether they are to be read in isolation one article in one case and it has been held by the supreme court surprisingly that all these articles they are independent of each other we shall not read them together article 19 article 21 and article 22 are different articles and they will have no linking they were delinked by the supreme court majority by justice fazal ali he said no they are to be read together they are forming part or cohesive part of the constitutional provisions 
This was the consequence provided in this case. And thereafter came the next consequence. And that was the case before the Supreme Court. And that was the case before the Supreme Court was a very historic case. After 28 years, long period wherein this law was followed in India, since thereafter to be not a good law of India. India was governed. Our criminal jurisprudence was dominated for this law, which afterwards is said to be not a good law for 28 years. There was the sufferance of the criminals. And now came the case of Maneka Gandhi versus Union of India, AIR 1978 Supreme Court, page number 597. Now, there were seven judges bench constituted. And this was again and again coming before the court. And this criminal jurisprudence was dominated by the few that procedure established by law means procedure of the preventive detention and not the principles of natural justice. Principles of natural justice had no place. And it is the procedure of Preventive Detention Act was the consequence of the previous judgment holding ground for 28 years. Now came the case of Menaka Gandhi versus Union of India, a popularly known as a passport case. We'll not go into political details, but that is the consequence of the emergency and after effects of the emergency. In this case, issue arose before the Supreme Court. Whether that term, those three words, procedure established by law means what? Whether it is a procedure as was understood by the court in an earlier case decided by the Supreme Court or whether this is the just reasonable and the principles of natural justice to be followed or not was the question before seven judges bench of the Supreme Court. When seven judges of the Supreme Court, they were faced with this issue. Now they found that so far Article 21 so far, Article 21 was said to be acting in isolation for the first time. Supreme Court judges by majority in this case said that Fazal Ali was correct. Justice Fazal Ali, while deciding that earlier case, as just now we have concluded, uh, arising from state of Madras, Fazal Ali said that that case was not correctly decided. These seven judges were faced with the problem whether our criminal jurisprudence, our criminal philosophy, our jurisprudence behind that earlier case is correct or not, whether we have to change the philosophy or not. And the Supreme Court changed the philosophy, friends. In this case, surprisingly, the seven judges bench, they said that minority view in earlier case is correct and majority view is incorrect or wrong. They overruled the earlier case. Earlier case was overruled and they said by the majority and there were different judgments delivered. Majority held that such Article 21, either to four, was said to be dormant, less important. However, now hereafter, now that is to be accepted. That is to be accepted as the most powerful article in the Constitution. Two sentences. Let us see the wisdom of Dr. Ambedkar. Let us see the wisdom of the constant assembly in drafting so precisely and keeping it to the conscience of the justices of the Supreme Court. They said that life, pers no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law. Now those words were to be interpreted by seven judges of the Supreme Court and they said yes. Procedure established by law, it does not mean by the Preventive Detention Act. It does not mean by the Parliament's law. It means such procedure shall be just reasonable procedure. The principles of natural justice must be followed. And comes a very uh, nice statement by Justice Krishna here when deciding this case. The great philosopher and the judge of the Supreme Court, he said in this case, Justice Krishna here, he said that, look here, that this Various articles are not different islands. You cannot separate them. They are not different islands. They are having the cohesive force and they are to be, they must be read together. And likewise, this case was decided. An earlier case was overruled after 28 years only, which procedure to be followed. That was the basic change in the constitutional jurisprudence with reference to Manika Gandhi's case, that is the today's law. This case, thereafter, after Manika Gandhi, there were cases after cases and in case of TV Vithisharan versus Tamil Nadu, reported in AIR 1983 Supreme Court page number 361, issue again arose to assess, reassess the case of Maneka Gandhi. Earlier case was overruled. Maneka Gandhi was now the final decision given by seven judges of the Supreme Court, and immediately thereafter came the issue before the Supreme Court. How to read the relationship of these three articles? Article 19. Article freedoms, 
Article uh, 21, life and liberty, personal liberty, and Article 22 regarding the criminals. Now, for the first time, Supreme Court said by making reference to the majority judgment of the Supreme Court in Maneka Gandhi's case that Article 19, Article 21, and Article 22, they are, they sustain, they strengthen, and they nourish each other. Let us see how in three words they are uh, describing the entire scheme of the constitutional provisions. They said that these are, the, there is an inbuilt mechanism. These three articles, they support each other and they strengthen each other and thereby a very sound basis of the constitution is made is the outcome of the judgment in this case. After Menika Gandhi, friends, you know, in the constitution, there is no plethora of the judgments. This is the, this is the start. Thereafter, constitutional approach change. In that word life, in that word life, now everything is included. You must have studied the case of Francis Caroli versus Delhi, wherein it is said human dignity is a fundamental right. Then came the case of Onega Telis versus Bombay Municipal Corporation. It has been said life means not only animal existence, it should be the digni dignified life. And then in case of Shanti Star Builders versus NK Totane, it has been hailed food, clothing, and good environment is also a fundamental right. That is how, friends, look from where we started and where we reached. Let us see the Supreme Court in the year 1950, and let us see today where the Supreme Court has traveled, and that is because of the change in the philosophy of the judges. Judges, they contributed most in this behalf. This is one first segment as to procedure established by law that we have discussed. Let us go to the next segment, friends. I will divide this discussion into various segments if time permits. Next segment is the application as to doctrine of crown immunity. Let us see how law has been changed. Let us see how law is always progressive. And this progress is either by law of the parliament or by interpretation of the provisions by the judges of the Supreme Court and High Court. This has been provided here. Let us see first what is crown immunity. Let us first see crown immunity means what? Immunity means protection, exception. Crown immunity means it is the sovereign protection. Sovereign claim the protection. Usually that was the law in criminal law and in tortious law in England in those days. In respect of sovereign acts, there was no liability of the king or the crown. That was the English common law then. And there was a very simple principle of English law. King can do no wrong. What has been done by the English king, it is not wrong. And therefore, there is no punishment. And therefore, no damages. Nothing against the king. Nothing against the state. Nothing against the sovereign was the English principle. After India became independent and after Indian constitution came into force, for the first time, issue arose before the Supreme Court of India, a case whether in India we follow this immunity of the crown, whether Union of India, whether Government of India is immune from any liability. Can they claim the supremacy? Can they claim the sovereignty? And they say that we are not liable, whether this principle is applicable in India or not. It was, it was very just. Anybody must have thought. Lawyers were thinking, no, in India, in democratic India, there is no place for application of this principle of crown immunity, that state and all other individuals are at the same level, they are at par, was our usual thinking. But unfortunately, there was a judgment of the Supreme Court coming, and that judgment was also not of a one or two or three judges, it was a judgment of the seven judges. Seven judges delivered such a judgment, which within few years time was overruled by nine judges of the Supreme Court. See, within two years time, how philosophy has been changed. There was a philosophy when these seven judges, they decided the case coming from Calcutta, that was the case of Director of Rationing versus Corporation of Calcutta, AIR 1960, Supreme Court, page number 1355. Was a case coming up before the Supreme Court. As the case was before the Supreme Court, it was very simple. Issue was very simple that in this case, issue was in respect of crown. Crown means here the sovereign, the Union of India. And in case of Union of India, whether there can be any action for act of state or not. In thoughts, you have discussed act of state. Whether for act of state, there is liability or not. And you find surprisingly, the majority of the seven judges bench held that no, crown is not liable. No, 
the sovereign is not liable no the union of india is not liable there is the principle of crown immunity is applicable in india in short that principle that bad principle that king can do no wrong has been incorporated in indian law by the majority of the seven judges in the case of director of rationing versus corporation of culture all we are stunned you know, after all it is a judgment of the supreme court we can never say that it is a wrong judgment at the most we can say judgment was not adorned the lawyers may argue advocates may say but we the student of law and the teachers in law we shall never say that supreme court judgment was wrong at the most we say that that judgment was not commanding the respect that was not adorned by the uh, legal field and especially after this judgment in director of rationing versus corporation of calcutta there was hue and cry that state can do anything and yet it is not liable and it is a judgment not of the two judges or not of the full judgment Uh, full bench or of the uh, constitutional bench but of the seven judges bench of the supreme court and therefore within two years time there was a case before the supreme court that was the case of superintendent and remembrance of the legal affairs of west bengal versus corporation of calcutta that was the case reported in air 1967 supreme court page number 997 this first case of director of rationing was delivered Judgment was delivered in the year 1960. For seven years, this principle was followed. After seven years, nine judges said, "Oh, that was a wrong decision." After seven years, they said, "No, we don't follow the English principle. We have discarded and we have disowned when the Constitution came into force." But from 1950 to 1967, for 17 years, we are following that principle. What's the consequence with reference to the jurisprudential change? With reference to the next judgment, that is, superintendent and remembrance of legal affairs of West Bengal versus Corporation of Calcutta. There was earlier case was reconsidered. Seven judges bench. decision was reconsidered by the supreme court and they say earlier decision of the supreme court is wrong it needs uh, revisiting that judgment was revisited and thereafter it was reconsidered and then they said that this is to be overruled that principle which thomas fuller dr thomas fuller he said he is applying here i have said in the uh, early first five or 10 minutes that thomas fuller he has said we ever so high the law is not above you you may be so high you may be holding any position but the law is always above you that thomas fuller statement is followed by judge and it has been written in the judgment of the judge supreme court judge said yes be you ever so high the law is above you the union of india the union of india the government of india may be so high but this law the constitution is above you is the principle is the philosophy inculcated and imbibed by the judgment of the supreme court after this segment of the crown immunity that principle that king can do no wrong has now no place in india and this by nine judges bench this uh, new jurisprudence has been incorporated english principle has been thrown out of india now by nine judges in the year 1967 then we go to the next consequence that next consequence is with reference to relationship between two laws relationship between administrative law and relationship between the principles of natural justice how they are correlated is the question whether they are correlated or not and whether while applying for administrative law whether administrators shall follow the principles of natural justice or not was a very simple question what is simple question that whenever administrative law is to be applied whether principles of natural justice to be followed or not and today everybody says yes natural justice or principles of natural justice must be followed in all cases issue was now it is so settled but it was not so friends in past supreme court in the year 1959 so provided that was the case before the supreme court the name of the case was radhesham khare versus state of madhya pradesh reported in air 1959 supreme court page number 107 but today we are discussing was not so in the year 1959 for 9 years for 9 years and thereafter there was something wrong uh, to be provided as to administrative law and application of administrative law whether administrative law and principles of natural justice are two wheels of the justice or not or whether it is only the administrative law and in case of application of administrative law there is no place for the principles of natural justice 
and has been held by the Supreme Court very surprisingly. And very surprisingly, Supreme Court said in that case, of course, by majority, that principles of natural justice, basic principles of life, they have no place. They are not applicable when the administrative law is applied. In this case, the Corporation of Calcutta and the body of Corporation of Calcutta, uh, that was, uh, I'm sorry, at Madhya Pradesh uh, Municipal Corporation, that committee was abolished. And when that committee was abolished, they said that the contention was that no opportunity of hearing was given to us. Whenever any action is to be taken against anybody, at least hear us. Uh, we know the principle of Adi Alterum Parte. No order shall be passed behind any person. This is a very basic principle. Even our first law student knows it. Issue was whether Supreme Court was knowing this or not. Whether this was so in the Supreme Court or not. And you will find friends, this was not so in the Supreme Court. In this case, the constitutional bench of the Supreme Court held that no, in such a case, in such a case, whenever there is application of administrative law, principles of natural justice, they have no application. You need not follow the principles of natural justice was stated by the Supreme Court. Only one judge dissented. That is the strength of the dissenting judgment. When a, any person, he has courage to say that, no, I don't agree, that I don't agree, that disagreement ultimately becomes the law of country. Likewise, as earlier case we have discussed, we are discussing Menaka Gandhi's case. Likewise, in this case also, what has been said and held by the Supreme Court in Radhisham Khare's case, appeared to be unjust to the, the same Supreme Court in the subsequent case. That was with reference to the minority judgment, dissent was noted by Justice K.K. Subhar Rao. In our discussion, he will come at least four or five times. He is the person who to the greatest extent changed the Indian constitutional jurisprudence, especially the case to be discussed in Golaknath and other cases at a later stage. But here was the beginning of entry of the K.K. Subarao in deciding factor of the Supreme Court. And K.K. Subarao, he said, no, even in case of application of administrative law, you must apply principles of natural justice. But it was a minority view, did not prevail. But thereafter came <coughs> a case before <coughs> the Supreme Court. That was the case of A.K. Kripa versus Union of India. A.K. Kripa, K-R-A-I-P-K versus Union of India, 1969. Volume number two, SCC, page number 262. And in this case now, see, first case was decided in the year 1959. That was followed for 10 years. 10 years in India, principles of natural justice were, were not to be followed whenever administrative law was applied. And while in this case, the Supreme Court came out with the solution and they said, no, look, principles of natural justice shall prevail in every case. And they said, whenever there is application of administrative law, principles of natural justice must prevail was the consequence of the judgment in A.K. Krupa versus Union of India. And then came the constitution bench. Justice K.K. Supara had such a strength in his judgment that ultimately this issue was before the constitution bench of five judges of the Supreme Court. And that was the case of S.L. Kapoor versus Jag Mohan. In case of Yes, sir. Kapoor versus Jack Mohan, in case of this constitution bench, which is reported in AIR, I'm sorry, uh, 1980, volume number four, SCC, page number 370. And by this constitution bench, in the year 1980, that earlier judgment of Radesh Amkare came to be overruled by the constitution bench. See how it has been changed. Let us see why Dr. Ujola, madam, suggested this topic. The beauty is here. The beauty of the today's discussion is here. We followed the law from constitution came into force and especially after judgment of 1959 till 1980 for about for about 30 years for about 30 years wrong law was being applied in india or law was being applied in india in a different way that did not that was not approved by the apex court in this case of hl kapoor that is how friend the jurisprudence has been changed the philosophy has been changed in the supreme court then we come to the next very vital issue as to personal liberty. This personal liberty issue is to be discussed, especially with reference to the provisions in the constitution. Again, we come to article 21 of the constitution. We have to discuss again article 21. Article 21 provided for two aspects. 
just now we have discussed what that no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law those provisions established by law that we have discussed from the earlier case from 1950 to menaka gandhi and that discussion is over now let us come to another one word from uh, article 21 personal liberty no person shall be deprived of his personal liberty what is personal liberty and you will find for the simple two words there had been very long journey of the supreme court rather these are the two words which were having most attractive consequence in the constitutional jurisprudential development let us go to that here we are discussing how father he delivered a judgment which his son thereafter overruled rather friends this is very novel in india this can happen only in india justice chandrachur the senior justice chandrachur who had been the chief justice of india he had decided a case ultimately his son he overruled his own decision his father's decision let us come to that aspect with reference to article 21 now article 21 provides for personal liberty that is another element of personal liberty <clears throat> now this issue was whether during proclamation of emergency such right exists or not that is very simple no doubt the framers of the constitution they have granted us life and personal liberty they are they are inculcated in our personality they are in alienable rights of the human being no doubt issue was whether these rights life and personal liberty are available to us during proclamation of emergency or not was the question before the supreme court for the first time in the year 1966 in the case of state of maharashtra versus prabhakar panduranga sanjagiri at that time this sanjagiri uh, he was detained in jail during china war when during china war he was detained in the jail he wrote a book and that name of the book was inside the atom a t o m inside the atom he intended to communicate this with his family friends and wife etc government denied the permission issue arose as to his personal liberty that whether a person can even during proclamation of emergency can have a personal right or not to write the book and other things and supreme court said yes he can write a book but there are restricted rights during proclamation of emergency but a detainee a person arrested person put into prison he has right to book uh, write a book and to publish it thereafter came a case before the supreme court and that is very uh, interesting case rather one of the judge himself has said it is a notorious case we the lecturers we the teachers in law we shall never say it is a notorious case we must say that it is not respected case and that case was the adm jabalpur versus shivakant shukla's case adm jabalpur versus shivakant shukla's case that was decided in the year 1976 on 28th april 1976 reported in air 1976 supreme court page number 1207 and this case was decided by a bench comprising of five judges name are very material friends names of the judges are very material case was decided by justice a n ray justice m h beck justice chandrachur y v chandrachur justice p n bhagwati and the another judge the fifth judge was justice hans raj khanna there were five judges when these five judges they decided this case of adm jabalpur versus shivakant shukla you know i am only uh, without uh, keeping apart political aspect we'll say when mrs gandhi she declared emergency then uh, thousands of people they were put into jail without any inquiry issue was raised before the supreme court in this adm jabalpur case that whether in such a case fundamental right as to personal liberty of a citizen is frozen or not whether that is available to me or not whether that is now which was said and understood to be an inalienable right non separable from my personality can be separated during emergency or not was the question before the apex court before these five judges great judges great personality unfortunately unfortunately there was a division amongst them four judges of the one view and one judge of the other view four judges including justice uh, chief justice a n ray chief justice beck justice chandrachur and justice bhagwati they held all the four judges they held that yes during emergency a citizen will not have no personal liberty right you cannot have this right even justice bhagwati went to the extent of saying that that state shall not give the reasons 
for arresting you, they need not give the reasons what the judgment of the day. And that judgment was delivered only one person he dissented, and that was Justice uh, Hansraj Khanna. Justice Hansraj Khanna, he said, no, habeas corpus petition is maintainable and right of personal liberty is available, but it was his minority judgment. Judgment was delivered. All other persons, they become chief justices, except Justice Khanna. Except Justice Khanna, Justice Ray was Chief Justice, Justice M.H. Beg was Chief Justice, thereafter Justice Chandrachur, he had become Chief Justice, Justice Bhagwati had become Chief Justice. But this gentleman who delivered dissenting judgment, which was not favoring the government, which was not favoring the political party philosophy, he was forced to resign. He resigned, he sacrificed his post, he would have become Chief Justice, he would have become everything, he, he would have gone to the International Court of Justice, but he said no. I will just be honest to my chair, my allegiance to the constitution. He was, he, I have taken oath of constitution, I'll be allegiance to the constitution and not to the political party. He resigned. Thereafter, everything was all right. It was emergency. No, everybody was fearing to say anything. Even judges, they closed the mouth while the criticism then. And then nobody in India praised Justice Khanna. Justice Khanna, about him, there was only one report that was not in India. His name was silent in India. Nobody could have that daring to speak uh, about him and praise him. But there was a news in New York Times. In New York Times, there was a big news, half page news about him. And when a news was published in New York Times in England, I'm sorry, in America, let us see what was written. And there was, it was said, everything about judgment was said how it was a black judgment, dark day in the democracy of India that is also stated in that news item. And at the end, it is very vital for my student friends, my brothers and sisters. Remember, this Justice Khanna, about him, they have written, they have said that whenever in India, there will be a temple of justice will be built or reconstructed, then statue of Justice Khanna will be put in place. That will be installed in place. That is how he was praised. This Justice Khanna, thereafter he retired, he resigned rather, not retired, he resigned. And then he has written a book, nor neither the roses nor the thorns. My young brothers and sisters, I will advise you to read his book, neither the roses nor the thorns. And that is a great uh, book about him. That is how he is remembered in the history. Other judges may not be remembered, but he is remembered throughout the history. And then came this, uh, judgment was rather uh, not looked into. This judgment was not looked into. In one of the conferences, in one of the conferences, the then Chief Justice of India, Justice M. N. Venkateshalaya, he said that this judgment shall be thrown to the dustbin. See how acting Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he says that judgment of the Constitution bench of the Supreme Court must be thrown to the dustbin. That was the comment. However, Justice Bhagwati, afterwards in one conference, he said, I committed a wrong in delivering the judgment. I committed a wrong in delivering the judgment in that uh, ADM Jabalpur case. However, there was an amendment of the constitution, that was 44th amendment, and this ill effect of this judgment of ADM Jabalpur was taken away. When this effect was taken away, everybody was thinking, okay, that case is now uh, forgotten by the people. It was the darkest day, but forgotten by the people. Thereafter came the last case, and that has been recently decided. That was Justice Puttu Swami, retired High Court Judge, versus Union of India, also known as Aadhaar case. Now in this Aadhaar case, earlier case was decided by uh, Constitution Bench of Five Judges. was decided. Four verses, one was the judge, and now consider the importance of the the larger this was different work and included Chief JK Khair, Justice R. Ayan Anand, Justice Najir, Justice R. F. Narima, Justice Gaur Chandrachur, and other judges they constituted this nine judges bench. This case was decided. This case was decided, one of the judge who was on the bench, he observed about this earlier case. Now, Justice Chandrachur, Justice Dr. Dhananjay Chandrachur, 
while writing this judgment he said that earlier judgment is hereby overruled earlier we have said that judgment of father has been overruled by his able son but regarding this judgment one of the judge in the judgment he wrote justice uh, justice vishal khan kishor khan judge he said the adm jabalpur case was an aberration in the constitutional jurisprudence of our country and the disability of bearing it the majority opinion 10 fathom deep with no chance to resurrection what he said friend to simplify this he said let us put into soil 10 feet down so that it shall not come away that is how the jurisprudence changes in the portents of the supreme court especially in respect of personal liberty matters then we go to the next aspect let us see how sometimes the judges they they are unbecoming of the post and there is another uh, segment to be discussed i am aware about my time and uh, uh, i request the principal madam to ring the bell when my time is over uh, next we come to the next segment next segment is regarding uh, the provisions in respect of article 31a and article 31b my uh, uh, junior colleagues they are knowing my student friends they are knowing who have studied the constitution that after commencement of the constitution then the first prime minister jawaharlal nehru he wanted to have to some extent the concept of the socialism in india and when that was to be done he provided here that that by first amendment by first constitutional amendment there was a seven schedule provided and there was a provision made whenever any law is made and that is put into the seventh schedule then its constitutional validity cannot be changed that was the strange amendment in the constitution what is the amendment i will tell you article 31a article 31b and thereby by this first amendment it was provided that seventh schedule is created at the end of the constitution and whenever any law is enacted by the parliament and parliament provides that this law should be put in the seventh schedule then its constitutional validity cannot be challenged was the amendment provided and especially this was why it was done why any law was put beyond the constitutional uh, purview why it shall not be challenged before the courts afterwards it has been challenged it has been set aside but earlier it was said in the year 1950 this was said let us see why this was because this was said to be an agrarian movement government wanted some lands for its uh, development and when land was to be taken compensation was to be paid when compensation was to be paid it must be the reasonable or proper market value compensation government did not want to pay or it was not desirous of paying it and therefore they made such laws so as to provide for acquisition of laws lands this provision was made and this particular provision which was by the first constitutional amendment in the year 1950 was challenged immediately within few months time before the supreme court and that was in the case of shankari prasad versus union of india shankari prasad versus union of india and that was reported in air 1951 supreme court page with the leadership of the first chief justice of the supreme court justice m h kenya who was also the chief justice in the federal court and this first chief justice and other judges they decided this case that they said that such amendment they are beyond parliamentary the, these parliamentary powers are beyond judicial review we are helpless in such matters whenever by constitutional amendment anything is put in the seventh schedule the supreme court becomes helpless we cannot look into the matter that is the provision made especially with reference to the seventh and the ninth schedule provided here and then came the issue with reference to this case this case which was decided by virtue of first amendment regarding the seventh and the ninth schedule it continued to hold ground for 13 long years this provision put in initial any law into the schedule and protecting it providing for the protecting umbrella this provided for uh, long 13 years and came next the 17th amendment in the constitution the 17th amendment what challenge before the supreme court and that was challenge in the case of sajjan singh dev versus state of rajasthan when this case was challenged <coughs> in the supreme court <coughs> in the case of sajjan singh dev 65 supreme court page number 845 and there was five judges bench constituted there was three versus two majority there was three versus two majority and again it has been held that this is beyond the powers of the court 
Supreme Court. There can be no judicial review of such thing when they are put into the ninth seat or the seventh and ninth seat. That was the protective umbrella. Then we are helpless. What was the judgment of the majority? Two judges they dissented. And always look into when you become lawyer friends. Always look into the dissenting judgments. There is the seeds of the further development of law. And those two dissenting uh, judges were Justice Siraitullah and Justice Mudholkar of the Supreme Court. They said no. There is nothing beyond the scope of the Supreme Court. <clears throat> However, this continued for uh, two years time. And then came very famous case of Golaknath versus State of Punjab. There was a case of Golaknath versus State of Punjab reported in AIR 1967 Supreme Court page number 1643. Now for the first time, a bench of 11 judges was constituted. Now courts realized, now the Chief Justice realized, yes, every time, now issue arises, Parliament is doing something, whether that is beyond the scope of the uh, Supreme Court's judicial review power or not. And this question was frequently arising before the Supreme Court. And this was frequently arising before the Supreme Court. For the first time, 11 judges bench was constituted in Golaknath's case. And here, again, as I have said in earlier case, that great reformer, great philosopher judge, Justice K. K. Subarov, he had in the Supreme Court. He was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. There were 11 judges and Justice K. K. Subarov, he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, unfortunately, see how sometimes it appears. It's such great judges of the Supreme Court. It was five versus five. Five judges saying, yes, Supreme Court can interfere and Supreme Court can have power of judicial review. While other five judges, they said, no, no, Supreme Court cannot have power of judicial review. Five versus five. And Justice K. K. Subbara, in his deciding judgment, in his uh, weighing judgment, he said, I join this group. And thereby he said, yes, Parliament cannot touch the fundamental rights. He said, K. K. Subbara's words are very vital. They are to be written in golden ink. He said, look, fundamental rights are transcendent rights. They are having origin the God, they are godly rights, they are human rights, and you cannot take them away at any time. Therefore, he said that such rights nobody can be deprived of, and fundamental right chapter is a transcendental right, is the phraseology used by uh, Justice K. K. Subarao, the then Chief Justice in Golaknath's case long back in the year 1967. And thus, now, friends, there were two schools. Because this was a very thin majority. What was the thin majority? Six versus five. Rather, five versus five, and then Chief Justice joined them. Therefore, there were two views in Supreme Court. In the under the dome of the Supreme Court, there were two views of the judges themselves. There were judges having twofold philosophy, and twofold philosophy of the judges was one group was saying, "Yes, Supreme Court shall have power of judicial review, even that law is put into ninth or seventh seat." While the other judges they were saying, "No, no." The Supreme Court shall not have such a power of judicial review. Such were the two groups and came the next case. After this, Golaknath was decided, fundamental rights by very thin, six versus five majority, they were declared to be transcendental and uh, inalienable rights of the citizens of Union of India. However, thereafter, this issue was again before the Supreme Court. And was the case before the Supreme Court, the case of R.C. Cooper versus Union of India, and case was decided in the year uh, 1970, volume number one, SCC, page number 248. In this case, all judges, there were again 11 judges, because earlier case was decided by 11 judges. Golaknath was decided by 11 judges. Now this case of R.C. Cooper, popularly known as bank nationalization case was also decided by 11 judges. When this case was to be decided by 11 judges, now all the judges, they said, yes, Supreme Court shall have power of review. 10 judges were saying, 10 judges were saying that as per Golaknath, the Supreme Court shall have power of judicial review. However, however, on the other hand, only one judge deferred, only one judge deferred and he was Justice A. N. Ray. Justice A. N. Ray, he deferred and he said, Justice A. N. Ray, he deferred and he said, no, Supreme Court shall have no power of judicial review. Which Justice A. N. Ray? That Justice A. N. Ray, that Justice A. N. Ray, after or during emergency, was elevated as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by Srimati Indira Gandhi. That Justice A. N. Ray, he said, no, he was just favoring the government in the judgment of bank nationalization case. There was very surprising consequence of this.
because people they are looking towards you you are under the microscope judges of the supreme court and the great lawyers under microscope likewise justice a n ray was also under microscope and then came the statement about him the statement was about him uh, that was by the uh, ck daftari the who was member of rajya sabha then ck daftari then attorney general of india and a very great jurist of that time was also thereafter became the member of rajya sabha when he was member of the rajya sabha justice a n ray who delivered the dissenting judgment then he is saying yes supreme court is superior he said no no supreme court is not superior supreme court shall have no judicial review doctrine applicable he was the only person let us see what uh, just uh, uh, mr uh, ck daftari said about him in the parliament in the house he said there the boy who wrote the best essay got the first prize that boy means n ray who wrote the best essay that is judgment fearing the government of indira gandhi and he was given the best prize afterwards became the chief justice of india because of his judgment was the criticism by justice uh, ck uh, daftari of this case and then came the most uh, noteworthy case that is known as the fundamental rights case or keshavanand bharati versus uh, the state of kerala in case of keshavanand bharati versus state of kerala reported in air 1973 supreme court page number 1461 in this case for the first time in the history of the supreme court either to for what happened in the earlier case of first case of shankari prasad five judges then 11 judges and then in the next case there were 11 judges for the first time in the history of the supreme court 13 judges bench was constituted all others are knowing but by my student friends this case is a historic case when this case was argued before the supreme court and was decided by the supreme court its volume which we people the lawyers and the teachers they read it is about 5000 pages judgment of the supreme court when the judgment was delivered by the supreme court justice sm sikri he was the chief justice and there were there were other judges of the supreme court in this case that minority view that minority view in the earlier case was taken as the base it has been said that parliament shall have all the powers amending the constitution but you shall not change the basic structure of the constitution for the first time that has been in the history of the supreme court concept of basic structure theory came to be laid down by the bench of 13 judges by its majority this is the as good as a final law for india there are no chances of overruling this law and immediately within 7 uh, 8 years time was the case before the supreme court case was decided by justice chandrachur senior chandrachur then and justice bhagwati of the supreme court was the case of minerva mills limited versus union of india minerva mills limited versus union of india reported in air 1980 supreme court page number 1769 there was a majority view and a minority view justice uh, y v chandrachur then he was the chief justice of india and he decided this case and then accordingly it was said that basic structure theory is the basic rule in constitutional interpretations and the provisions of the constitution that is how great judges their personality great judges their personality their views and their philosophy changed the portraits of the supreme court and they changed the law of india that is how that is holding ground till today then comes the next issue we we'll go to the short segment now we are ending to we are heading towards the end then comes the environmental jurisprudence development in the supreme court fortunately i had been to your institute uh, as per the request of uh, uh, dr ujala madam and had been a seminar on this environmental jurisprudence itself in your dr bi patin college itself i had been i had honor to be there for addressing the students friends let us see the development of environmental jurisprudence in the supreme court you ask me a question sir sir why whenever there is a fundamental right and there is no law of the parliament then supreme court will take care of everything in the absence of a written law in the absence of a written law supreme court can and supreme court is empowered to develop the law itself and where is the power and has been observed by the supreme court itself that look whenever there is no written law there are directive principles they are said to be a mine from which minerals can be taken out and law can be fashioned by the supreme court 
therefore rough law law in the crude form in the fourth part of the constitution that is directive principle of state policy hitherto for it was thought hitherto for it was considered that uh, directive principles of no value there are only directive supreme court said no that there are the seeds we can take them out and there can be fundamental rights coming up out of it therefore the supreme court used the same theory in respect of development of the environmental jurisprudence by the supreme court judgments let us go to the basic cause let us see again article 21 In Article Twenty One, we have discussed no person shall be deprived of his life and personal liberty except in accordance with the procedure established by law. Word life, what is life? And that word life, the expansion of the concept of life is responsible for development of environmental jurisprudence by the apex court by various judgments. Let us see what has been said. There is. there is expansion of the concept of life by the supreme court and three theories have been uh, evolved by the supreme court so as to sustain this so as to support this so as to come out of it supreme court laid down three basic principles three jurisprudential norms and such three jurisprudential norms they have become the principles of the day to day every day any person arguing before the supreme court or before the national green tribunal at delhi and at pune also he says three words in every after every word or after every uh, paragraph there are three phrases used by we the lawyers and by the honorable judges first is sustainable development then the precautionary principle and then the polluter phase principle friends these are not they were not stated in any written law till then for the first time these words were invented by their lordships of the supreme court they invented these phrases and they developed the law of india this terminology they have been it has been developed and then there was a law called as the environment protection act of 1986 passed by the supreme court by the parliament till from the constitution till this 86 act of environment protection act of 1986 was passed in this phase supreme court was law making supreme court provided for environmental jurisprudence let us see what was that and for that purpose <coughs> you will find sometimes our our opening was or uh, i have suggested by our principal madam that it shall be judgments of the courts friends sometimes not only the judges they contribute but many times the toric personalities and the advocates they also contribute and help the personality this entire law in the supreme court is the development because of one person of course there are a great number of uh, lawyers and advocates in the supreme court but noteworthy for this development Uh, advocate mc mehra senior advocate of the supreme court contribution in development of environmental jurisprudence he was awarded by the uh, government of india uh, with title as to padma shri for his work he was given padma shri by the supreme court because of this development of environmental jurisprudence and that started with the case of mc mehra versus kamal nath that was reported in uh, 1997 volume number 1 Uh, scc page number uh, 388 it was a, a very interesting case i will not go to the facts but it was against a, a heavy weight political champion or political personality and issue was taken to the supreme court that such political personality then they are using uh, such uh, environmental resources for their personal ends for the first time supreme court interfered and supreme court provided for this environmental jurisprudence supreme court you have a theory that we the citizens of india are the custodian of natural resources for the next generations they have you have a theory we are going to the international documents in this bia they followed that we the indians this present generation we are enjoying all these fruits because of our forefathers they have take they have given it to us we must keep we must preserve for our next generations this philosophy is to be found in the jurisprudence developed by the supreme court in respect of environmental jurisprudence and this was with reference to this very interesting and uh, uh, interesting case of mc mehra versus uh, kamal nath there are about 35 cases filed by uh, mr mc mehra advocate mc mehra in the supreme court this was one of the important case second case was filed by him that was regarding mc mehta versus vinan of india reported in 2009 volume number 6 scc page number 142 i will have the summary of his cases because 35 cases means about 35 minutes we don't have that much time 
So let us see what was the conclusion of MC Mehta's cases. There was a Tanneris case, there was a Taj Mahal case, and there was a number of cases by him. I will take only two sentences, Taj Mahal case, Taj Mahal Tripijan case. What was that? It was said by MC Mehta before the Supreme Court, because of the industries coming up in the vicinity of Taj Mahal, the national, international monument, worldly monument, now because of these industries and the fumes and the gases coming out of it, because of the environmental pollution, the marbles of the Taj Mahal, they are being affected. This was the case filed by him. Issue was before the Supreme Court. What was the issue? Whether that is relating to our life, whether in this case, the Supreme Court must interfere or not. Had it been a case that the somebody on behalf of that has filed a case was different. Say, for instance, Union of India has filed a case, it was different. MC Mehta was saying that right to have this Taj Mahal national monument is right of every citizen, including MC Mehta, was the contention raised in public interest litigation filed by him before the Supreme Court. Very interesting issue was there to protect a national monument, whether that is coming under word life or not was a question before the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court said in this case, yes, life means. Uh, life here means expanded concept of life and includes right to good environment also. And therefore, in that case, Supreme Court uh, provided for controlling those pollutions caused in the vicinity of uh, Taj Mahal, the national monument. And then was the case, uh, cases before the Supreme Court. I will name only, there was a case of uh, Vellore Citizen Welfare Forum versus Union of India. Then there was a case of T.N. Godavaran versus Union of India, wherein Supreme Court invented the principle of precautionary aspect. And then lastly, very interesting issue was discussed by the Supreme Court in the case of, and that was uh, regarding the Vellore Citizens case and Andhra Pradesh Pollution Control Board versus MV Nayuri's case. In these cases, it has been said that ecological issue and fundamental rights are correlated. Supreme Court I had entire discussion here, and that was relating to whether fundamental rights and ecological issues are interrelated or not. And has been held by the Supreme Court that we cannot separate ecological issues and fundamental rights. They are cohesive rights, and one is the consequence of other in that case. It has been provided the consequence in this case that the polluter pays principle, and these two issues have been provided. Only one mention I will make before parting with this issue. On whom the burden of proof lies. Usually you will find a normal person, ordinary person, he goes to the Supreme Court, he has no power uh, to fight against a great industry, burden of proof lies on whom? And in that earlier case of uh, Willow Citizens Forum, Supreme Court said, look, burden is on you, burden is on the state who is responsible for the pollution and not the citizen he has to prove. In such repetition, Factual position is not on the petitioner, but is on the industry to prove how he is not responsible for causing the pollution. And then Supreme Court said, he who causes loss to the environment has to compensate. He has to restore it by paying for the same. That is how the issue has been decided by the Supreme Court. I will now go to the next segment. Next segment is regarding public interest litigation also known as epistotal theory evolved by the Supreme Court. That everybody knows it. It is a very uh, commonly understood concept. But let us make a uh, mention about uh, four or five sentences because it is a very usual aspect of public interest litigation. This public interest litigation relates to the concept of the locus standi. Locus standi means, friends, my uh, colleagues here, uh, after you passing your examination and joining the bar, coming to the courts, you will find who can find the petition who can go to the courts. Anybody cannot go to the courts unless you have some interest in the subject matter. You are the affected person, you are the aggrieved person, or you are the interested person. Till then only you can go to the courts is the issue as to look first and I. Issue is, in all cases, you must have some interest, you must be affected, you must be aggrieved. But whether in case of violation of fundamental right, whether a good citizen, whether he can go to the Supreme Court and to the High Court for violation of the fundamental right of someone else. Can he be a good Samaritan for violation of fundamental rights of his uh, fellow citizens or not? And has been held by the Supreme Court in number of cases that any person, any uh, good citizen from India, he can have such a right to go to the Supreme Court. The important cases were uh, with reference to the judgment of Justice Krishnayar in court. It was Justice Krishnayar 
who was in the, deciding the case of ABSK uh, Sangha Railway versus Union of India. Akhil Bharatiya Soshi Karmachari Sangha versus Union of India, decided by the Supreme Court in the year 1981, Supreme Court, page number 298. And Justice Krishnayar, he said that there shall be a constitutional jurisprudence and class action in the representative manner. He allowed such public interest litigation then. And then there was next case regarding appointment of the uh, Supreme Court judges. That was the case of S.P. Gupta versus Union of India. Justice Bhagwati then said that judicial redress for public injury to be followed. Then was the case of Bandhu Mukti Morcha versus Union of India. Look here, only a letter was written by a person regarding the Bandhu Mukti Morcha. That was the bonded labor, wait bigger. For that bonded labor, only a letter was written to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Justice Bhagwati, Justice Pathak, who afterwards became the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court and Justice Sen of the Supreme Court, they heard the matter. And therefrom came the concept of jurisprudence of Epistotal theory. Epistotal theory means, Epistotal means Devadut, messenger of God. And whether now you can be a messenger of God or not, it is a messenger of a God, for first time, it has been held by the Supreme Court that even re later, return to the judges of the Supreme Court can and shall be treated as a read petition to be filed for violation of fundamental right. Whenever matter is about fundamental right, even later is sufficient, and that is to be stated to be a fundamental rights redressal by the Supreme Court. Last issue I'll discuss because there are uh, thousands of cases on public interest litigation. But last is very noteworthy. Last case is again that MC Mehta, Padmasri MC Mehta versus Union of India, reported in All India Reporter, 1987 Supreme Court, page number 1087. Issue is very simple. That it is a standard rule of Supreme Court and High Courts. That especially in read petitions, in read petitions, you shall not give any evidence. It is not allowed generally. However, in such cases, MC Mehta, he said that whenever there is breach and violation of fundamental right by the state or by such authorities acting under the state, then you must appoint the legal commissioners to take a survey and to make a, a factual uh, inspection of the premises. For the first time, in this case of MC Mehta, the socio-legal uh, commissioners were appointed by the Supreme Court to make a survey of, to make a survey of the factual position and to make a reference and report to the High Court and Supreme Court. That is how there is a development of public interest litigation. However, nowadays it is much criticized because it is said that such fundamental right is now subjected to the misuse thereof. That public interest litigation is becoming private interest litigation and sometimes publicity interest litigation. Supreme Court and High Court now has deprecated this practice and they have started imposing uh, lakhs of rupees as uh, the penalty. Very recently, a uh, lawyer of the Supreme Court, he was penalizing one lakh rupees penalty for misusing this position. I'll make only a last reference of the last segment into the permission of principal madam, and that is with reference to compensatory jurisprudence. For the first time, there is a bypass invented by the Supreme Court. What is done in the civil courts? What is done in motor accident tribunal cases is done by the Supreme Court now, known as compensatory jurisprudence. Especially in writ petitions also, sometimes what was held in writ petition scope was very simple things. Whether there is violation of fundamental right or not, that is to be decided. Whether for violation of this fundamental right, any compensation shall be paid or not. Whether there can be any monetary compensation or not was the question because damages, penalty, etc. are within the province of the civil courts. Whether in writ petition that can be done or not was the question before the Supreme Court and especially Supreme Court so said yes. And this was then started with reference to the case of Rudul Shah versus State of Bihar, uh, 1983, volume number four, SCC, page number 141. A person, he was in jail for a pretty long time. Even after his term was over, he was put into jail. Nobody was knowing whether he's in jail or not. And that was found that this, boy, this person is unnecessarily in jail. And then matter had been referred to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, now state must compensate him for violation of his fundamental right and wrongful detention of such a person. He was awarded some amount, say, to the tune of 30,000 rupees. And then there was an interesting case of Bhim Singh versus state of JNK. There was a member of, uh, uh, member of JNK assembly 
and opposite party uh, pressurized the police and he was arrested while he was going to the attending the session of the house then he filed habeas corpus before the supreme court supreme court the uh, provided for uh, not only release of the person immediately but also to pay to him rupees 50000 towards the compensation then came the case of very interesting case from delhi the case of sahini versus commissioner of police in this case the supreme court along with the release of a person or protecting of a person also ordered for the compensation again mc mehta padmasri mc mehta he filed a case before the supreme court mc mehta versus union of india air uh, 1987 supreme court page number 1086 and especially he also said that now you frame some norms for this he urged and requested the supreme court that every now and then a poor person cannot go to, to the court and wait for 5 years or 10 years to get the relief for violation of fundamental right you fix some norms and this mc mehta he caused the supreme court to frame the norms for awarding compensation in respect of violation of fundamental rights and then the last case i will discuss on this issue of compensatory injuries prudence that is the case of uh, sanjay gupta versus uh, state of madhya pradesh air 2014 supreme court page number 2982 it was very interesting case for the first time in the history of the supreme court issue came about interim compensation question of interim compensation was to be discussed as was happened in the bhopal tragedy case issue was in this case of uh, sanjay gupta what happened i will tell you in two sentence facts there was there is a victoria park in mirat city in madhya in this victoria park there was a well celebration and that ground which was owned by the municipal corporation was rented out for some events this was rented for some event and that was rented and that event was going on there was a fire because of the neglect of the authorities and there were 64 deaths and 100 persons were injured what is the proper forum for them to go to the civil court to go to the uh, tribunals and to ask for the compensation wait for 5 10 years and then to get the compensation in the meanwhile state awarded to the 2 lakh rupees central government awarded 2 lakh rupees now whether there can be further enhanced compensation and there can be interim compensation paid or not was the question before the supreme court for the first time in that case and supreme court held yes in such a case they were ordered to give 5 lakhs additional compensation and there was also an order for the interim compensation made in this behalf to conclude i will take only last 5 minutes last 5 minutes i will take only to discuss right to education that is uh, you people are studying this about right to education and the 86th constitutional amendment of 2002 article 21 a has been inserted as all of you know let us see some parts about this history let us see how this constitutional jurisprudence let us see why the parliament was compelled to enact this law, I mean, to amend the constitution and to have the law in this behalf who made the parliament to do it it was the supreme court it was the constitutional uh, jurisprudence on education by the supreme court judges and let us see how this, that has been said and it was with reference to the case of mohini jain versus state of karnataka decided and uh, reported in air 1992 supreme court page number 1858 and in this case supreme court said yes by reading article 45 that is directive principle along with the article 21 as to life every person shall have free and compulsory education in india but he said all indian shall have all students shall have free and compulsory education all all orders very vital immediately there was a next case before the supreme court that was the case of unni krishnan versus andhra pradesh 1993 uh, supreme court page number 645 and it is said here not all earlier judgment of mohinjan is better that is corrected and it is said not all students but students between 6 to 14 years they shall be given free and compulsory education and it is also provided in article 45 in the directive principles of state policy in the manner as the state may prescribe accordingly state was forced state was made parliament was compelled to make a law and that law was the right to children to compulsory education act of 2009 whereby children student of 6 to 14 years they must have free and compulsory education now 
by virtue of this earlier judgment of the supreme court because of the unni krishnan judgment the parliament was forced by the supreme court judgments to make amendment in the constitution and that was by uh, 86th amendment by way of inserting article 21 in the constitution that is how uh, this issue was discussed by the supreme court in thereafter that is the last case for today's discussion was a case before the supreme court called as pramati educational and cultural trust versus union of india reported in all india reporter 2014 supreme court page number 2114 whether this article so inserted in the constitution that is article 21a is constitutional or not whether that is ultra virus or it is intra virus was the question raised before the supreme court this 86th amendment inserting article 21a is valid or not and has been held by the supreme court ultimately yes it is valid and parliament has every power after reading article 21 read with article 45 that parliament can make such a law friends this is a short survey of various segments of the discussion with reference to the trends of uh, development of uh, the constitutional jurisprudence by judgments of the supreme court friends here i will rest Uh, i was given uh, time uh, of uh, one hour and uh, say about 30 minutes or so with this friends i conclude and, and i am really thankful to the uh, dr dy patel institute as well as uh, dr ujjwala madam uh, my other uh, staff in the faculty staff and my uh, colleagues friends brothers and sisters thank you thank you very much whether we are going with a question answer session yeah if any questions are there then uh, i'll be happy to answer them sure sure we'll take questions from youtube uh, there is a question uh, as you said personality and philosophy of a judge influence his her judgment or jurisprudence so what's yeah. your opinion about ex cgi go go a controversial personality uh, yeah. sexual harassment case against him in this connection let us go to that what cardozo has said first and then i will express my opinion uh, chief justice cardozo of the american court he has said yes there are is that in society so what is happening around them is of course they are subjected and they are susceptible to the same now issue is whether they shall be or not friends you find are we political philosophy this philosophy shall not be of a particular party in power might be his name or her name might be recommended that shall not be the dominating factor dominating factor shall be as has been said uh, that it shall be his allegiance to the constitution constitutional philosophy as he understands so therefore his understanding of the constitution should be reflected in the judgment and not what the political party understands should be reflected in the judgment political parties allegiance should be given up and constitutional allegiance or he has taken while taking appointment of the judge oath to the constitution or oath of the constitution he shall abide and he shall cherish the spirit of the constitution sir please uh, so the next question is was the press co co uh, conference made by four senior most judges of the supreme court on 12 jan 2018 was a best uh, was a step backward in the direction of constitutional jurisprudence no i i did not uh, get your uh was the i could not hear your question please repeat okay, sir. uh the, the question is was uh, the press co conference made by four senior most judges of the yeah. supreme court on 12 yeah. jan 2018 was yeah. a step backward in the direction of constitutional jurisprudence uh no in my opinion in my opinion in my frank opinion judges shall not speak openly against the institute first because say for instance you have to say something against our institute we shall go to the institute and say uh, shall register our grievances it does not mean say for instance one of our family member has something to say about me shall he go to the gate and shall have the uh, uh, say protest against me there no 
it shall be within four walls so they are the dignitaries they are the guardians of the constitution and once you guardians of the constitution are making public speeches according to me this is not good because thereby faith of the public in the judiciary will be lost okay thank you sir there is one more question uh, further the acceptance of rajya sabha seat by C former cj gogoi is ethical and proper what should be the moral stand see look uh, that is a very very important aspect it is better that question was raised and therefore i answer it would not have been better for me to start with this question see there is a uh, such a dilemma in indian judiciary from the beginning sometimes some judges of the supreme court they are uh, after retirement immediately elevated to the international court of justice and it is also criticized that because of the favoring judgments such a favor has been made to them sometimes you will find some judges they accept governorship and they become governors once you are occupying the highest post in the supreme court why to become an accept such a political post like a governor a mouthpiece of a chief minister and that is not befitting according to me the right philosophy of a great post of the judge of the supreme court according to as according to you that you are asking questions regarding mr rajendran gogoi uh, the former chief justice of the supreme court uh, being offered the post in the rajya sabha by virtue of the uh, political party in power i personally feel that it not good and judges has been said like scissors wife shall be above suspicion oh so there is a, one more question uh, can a supreme court decision on a question of law be overruled by subsequent supreme court bench on the same strength no uh, there is some hearing problem yeah, please speak loudly please uh, yeah sure sir uh, the question is uh, can supreme court decision on a question of law be overruled by hmm. subsequent supreme court bench of the same strength no 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 very recently was the issue before the supreme court and that was in respect of that was the issue in respect of the uh, land acquisition act there where you will find very interesting judgments of the supreme court if you give me 5 minutes time i will explain this very important issue how sometimes this happens in the supreme court in the uh, land acquisition law very recently this has happened there were judgments of two judges versus judgment of two judges versus judgment of two judges and then uh, the next two judges they were so aggrieved by giving wrong uh, the uh, judgments of the earlier court they stayed the judgment uh, they stayed all the law in the country all 30 high courts were directed by the two judges of the supreme court that no matter shall be heard unless matter is referred to the larger bench there is a provision in constitution as well as there is a provision in the uh, rules of the supreme court of india that whenever such issue arises matter should be refer should be should be referred to the larger bench otherwise there will be conflicting and inconsistent judgments for the people uh, causing confusion so there is a um, one more question can supreme court intervene to make a law that retired judges should not be allowed to uh, administrative or political post no supreme court cannot make it parliament can make it okay uh, there is one more question don't you think under current political regime independence of judiciary is under threat reference to elgar parishad case I will tell you this thing. It is not only this case, but it is from the very beginning of the constitution implications. So, as soon as constitution came into power, especially appointment of the judges in the early beginning of the constitution, they were criticized as political appointments, and therefore, it is always these two are at uh, two ends. Sometimes there is a friction, and sometimes there is a joining. Is the charge against the judiciary and against the parliament? It is said that sometimes there is a grave conflict amongst them, and sometimes they are coming together, and there is something wrong happening. However, I, I by and large, we believe in the. Uh, prudence of the judicial judicial officers <clears throat> and especially the great and tall personalities occupying and adoring such position stray instances one or there here might have happened but by and large uh, if we have the uh, large scale uh, scape of the uh, supreme court then you will find uh, uh, the functioning is very nice and especially there are no such favoring uh, done either way uh, thank you so much sir is there any more question you can ask
feel free to ask your questions uh sundaram we must stop here hello ma'am we must stop here yeah no ma'am please wait a minute so now i would like to invite uh, vanita ma'am for a vote of thanks yeah uh thank you rudraj on behalf of dr dy patel law college pimpri pune uh i vanita mohd express my sincere gratitude to advocate dr award sir sir has been associating with us since last uh, 15 years today also sir enlightened us on philosophical trends in constitutional jurisprudence by judgments of uh, the supreme court uh sir one again once again very big thank you sir Uh, for giving excellent coverage to the topic and uh, sir we seek your association with us in future also thank you sir uh, i also express my sincere gratitude to uh, the management of dr dy patel lunatic society dr dy patel law college pimpri pune for their support uh, and cooperation to make the event success uh, i would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our beloved principal ma'am Dr. Ujwala Shinde, uh, for her support and encouragement. Last but not least, I also express my sincere thanks to all the participants and my dear students. Thank you. Uh, I request to all the participants to join our next webinar, uh, which to be held on the thirteenth uh, June. Uh, 2020 on the subject that a future of india and indian judiciary uh, by honorable retired supreme court judge justice karju uh, thank you ruduraj thank you ma'am thank you everyone for joining us thanks a lot sir for giving your time with us thank you so much